Hi, it's Candace with Grow Local, and we're going to talk a little bit about pests and attracting beneficial insects. The first one I'm going to talk about are aphids, everybody's flavor favorite. I actually took a snip off of my rose bush and my kale. On the kale, you can see that there are some little gray, fuzzy looking dudes. Those are your gray aphids. There's a couple of little brown ones too because aphids come in lots of colors. I know I found a plant out in my garden today with little black aphids on it also, but when I went to pick them, do you think I could remember where it was? So today I'm just gonna show you the little gray ones and the little brown ones that were on my roses. Now these guys have little sucking mouth parts. So the easiest way to get rid of them is to simply use a good jet of water off your hose. As soon as you've knocked them down, if they were hanging on with those little sucking mouth parts, you've broken them. Those guys can't do any more damage even if they do crawl up on your, on your plants again. So they're easy peasy. Some people will use um, an ins a horticultural oil or horticultural soap. That works well too. Um, just be careful. I'm not going to say to use any home remedies. Some of them work brilliantly. Some of them not so much. The only thing I will say is be cautious if you are using dish soap, try it on a leaf first. If you're using a dishwashing liquid that has grease cutters in it, what you're going to do is you're going to damage the protective waxy coating that the leaves have on them and you're going to make them even more susceptible to insects and disease, okay? So that's kind of it for aphids. Squish them off with your fingers, great job for the kids. I can do it on the first two plants and then I just grosses me out. So that's why I use the hose and just jet them off. And he's gone. The next one are slugs. And are they ever rampant this year? We've, I've talked to people who had 100 heads of lettuce and they got six that came up. They know more came up, but those lovely little slugs came through with their little voracious appetites and just mowed them all down to ground level. The favorite one, is beer. If you've got a container and beer, give your slugs a party. It works really well. You only need about an inch of beer in the bottom of the in the bottom of the container, but then sink the container so that it's about an it sits in the ground with only maybe an inch of it above the soil level. Some people sink it in so it's right level with the ground, but you might find the occasional beetle that climbs in there and drowns. And Beetles eat lots of pests. You don't really necessarily want to get rid of those guys. So that's it. Oh, the other thing is try to make sure that your containers have a straight side. If they are nicely sloped, it's too easy for the slugs to crawl out. You want them to get in there, go straight down, and not be able to come back up. And you'll also find some slugs just come for a visit, have a drink, and then go. There are other things that you can use. I almost forgot. Um, there's bait and you can sprinkle that around. There's a couple of different ways. You can put it just around your plants that you have concerns with. You can broadcast it so it's just willy nilly and hope that the slugs are attracted to the scent and they go there. The other thing is put it outside of your garden area too so that you're not attracting the slugs just into where your plants are. Some people have a lot of success with putting um, wood ash in circles around the plants that they are concerned about. And some people will use the infamous diatomaceous earth. Fossilized little insect skeletons. It's super, super sharp. Whenever those um, slugs go crawling across it, they are gonna get sliced up. Their exoskeletons get diced up and they dehydrate and they'll die. The only reason I don't care for this stuff a whole lot is if it gets wet, it gets soft and you have to reapply it. And it's also indiscriminate. It can't tell the difference between earthworms, slugs, ladybugs, your ants, anything that goes across it is going to get cut up and die. So you might be killing your beneficials too. Another thing that you might want to try is your copper. You can get copper tapes. And apparently it's because when slugs go across it, they get a little bit of a, an electrical shock and they don't like it, so they'll turn around and they leave. I like this stuff if you're the artsy-fartsy kind. 
because you can use your, um, you can just do it freehand or you can get stencils. And if you've got a ballpoint pen, you can make designs. So you can pretty up your pots and have your, your copper tape going around it or your copper mesh. This is like a tube. So you can split it up, you can bunch it around your stems, you can put it over the, the lip. The only thing that you have to remember if you're using copper tape is make sure you don't have any slugs in that pot already or that there aren't any plants hanging over your bed or your area where you want to keep the slugs out of because they will climb and they will drop in and they'll just think it's a free-for-all. Nobody else can come in and share because you made it a private buffet for them. And I don't think I have any other tips and hints other than that can be your kids pick them up and drop them in a bucket of soapy water or if you got the kids you can get a long board you can put it down where you've got slugs and just prop it up with a rock or a stick so that there's a little damp area and they'll crawl under there to hide and then you just pick the board up in the morning and take them all off and throw them in your bucket of soapy water some people have good success with if you've had a grapefruit or half of an orange in the morning you just put the rind down and again prop it up just a little bit they're attracted to the scent and in the morning you just pick it up throw the whole thing in the garbage or drop it in a bucket of soapy water and use it again and there that's all I think I've got on slug prevention next one coming up the infamous caterpillars now I had the cat I had that lovely cabbage moth come or cabbage butterfly come and visit my place and I tried my darndest to save this guy and you know what he pupated on me can you see him next stage it's gonna be like a little cocoon and he's gonna come out as another one of those little lovely butterflies And easiest way of getting rid of these guys, again, is to pick them off. As soon as you find them, they are masters of disguise. If you look at the color, they are really, really hard to find on your plant. You are gonna see what they call their frass. It's that nasty looking, it's, I'm squishing it. But if you look on your plant, on your broccoli, on your kale, on your Brussels sprouts, you'll see little piles of wet looking black goo. And that's them from chewing it up and pooping it back out. So you know then between that stuff on your plant and the holes that you're getting in your leaves that you need to look really well. They will, if it's a curled leaf, they'll hide underneath. They love when they're the same color as your stock, the rib, they'll hide on there. There is a product that you can use, it's organic, it's called BTK, and this is a living bacteria. This is a concentrate, you mix it up with water in a jug and you spray it. Now this is wonderful because it only works on caterpillars, it doesn't hurt anything else, and the caterpillar actually has to ingest that bacteria, and then it will kill it from the inside out in about two to five days. So that's another one that you can use. Other than that, Pick them and turp them. They're ones I don't really mind squishing. One other thing I can talk about is carrot rust fly. Don't have any samples on that, but it's a little maggoty thing that goes through and leaves tunnels in your carrots. One of the ways that you can combat that is to get what is called a floating row cover or reme. It's a light white cloth. When you plant your seeds, you put the row cover already just float it on top, hold down the sides with soil or with rocks or with landscape pins so that it doesn't blow away in the breeze. And as the carrots grow, they actually just push up the cloth because it's that light. And your, um, the carrot rust fly can't get in there to lay its eggs. One of the other things, if you're on a second floor balcony, just grow your carrots, put them in a container. Those flies can't fly that high and you won't ever have a problem with it. Now, what can we talk about next? Flea beetles, my favorite. Don't usually have a whole lot of trouble with flea beetles in my vegetable garden, but last year I did have 
I'm not even sure what it was that was growing up in the garden and it was absolutely covered in flea beetles. They didn't bother anything else. So I left them alone when it was just totally covered in flea beetles. I picked it up, I put it in the garbage, closed the bag. I was done with that one. Um, otherwise, I would probably use the diatomaceous earth on it, but just sprinkle it on the plant that has the flea beetle or sprinkle it on the plants that are around your sacrificial plant and it should work. Um, other than that, research guys, that's all I know. And I didn't mention ants, and I didn't mention sow bugs. Now, everybody thinks that those two are horrible in your garden, and they're not. Some years we get lots and lots and lots of them, and other years we don't. These guys come in a lot of different colors. They come in, some of them are black, some of them are brown, some will roll up in a ball, and then we call them roly polies. I looked it up, they've got like over 27 different names that these guys are called. Um, they're actually, you guys, related to crustaceans. Their closest relative is probably the lobster. And if you want to get rid of them where it's possible and not always probable out here, they need moisture to breathe. They have um, specialized gills on these, on these plates on their abdomen and that's how they breathe. So if you want to get rid of them, dry the area out. They usually just go after dead and decaying matter. So they make a, a wonderful addition to improving your soil. It's just if there's not enough food or if there are really super small, tiny, tender shoots, then they will eat that. That's about the only time they're gonna be a pest. Once your plants get um, larger than a pencil lead, it's usually too big for them and they'll leave them alone. So I don't really mind them. And ants, those guys, they're voracious predators and they're voracious carnivores and they take, they take really good care of your soil. They aerate it, they take in dead plant material and get it underground to decompose. They're the ones that eat all those dead bugs that would pile up all over your garden. If you see them and they're all over your plants, chances are you've got the aphid problem because they will, they kind of protect those Aphids like we do cattle, they get a nectar from them and they take that back to the nest to feed the young. And they will, they will actually attack other insects that are going after the aphids. So that's when it's an issue. But if you hose those aphids off, your ant problem's gonna disappear. I did not mention deer. They are a big pest in the garden. And there are all sorts of remedies that might work, might not work. They're one of those, Really, I have no idea what to do. They can jump incredibly high, um, but there are a few things that I have heard, and talk to your neighbors because some work better in some areas than others, um, and you'll find out what has success in your neighborhood. For me, in the spring when they are just starting to do their foraging routes, I have been taught to put fishing line up at knee high and hip high, 18 inches, 36 inches. When they come through in the morning, it's so dawn, it's that twilighty kind of a color, and they can't see the fishing line. They bump into it, they feel it, they have no idea how high it goes, so they usually just turn around and they walk away. Then hopefully that's gonna stop them from thinking that my area is a good place to be. Um, I do, however, use utility netting and bamboo poles. I just put the poles in the ground and then I use twist ties or Velcro and attach the netting and it goes all the way around. Works out easy peasy. Today, I just pulled the pole out of the ground, set it aside. When we're done here, <laughs> pole goes back in its hole. My other one comes across and I just Velcro them together. Um, other people will tie CDs or bars of soap, reflector tape to strings and stuff. Um, there's one called um, a scarecrow and it's actually a mechanical thing that sits in your ground and it's attached to your water supply and it's motion detected. Anytime a deer comes by, this thing goes just like your sprinkler and startles them and they leave. Um, it doesn't discriminate either so if you forget about it you're going to get blasted if you walk too close to it and your dog's going to get hosed and maybe the cat in the neighborhood too. So. That's something else to think about. But deer, um, they will eat anything and everything. 
They love to sample, especially when they're young. I have them, they come in, they'll take a chomp off of something. If they like it, they take more. If they don't, they spit it out. And I go, oh, I need to grow more of that <laughs> and less of that. So again, find out from your neighbors, find out from your friends what's worked. Try anything and everything until you come up with something that's viable in your neighborhood or your garden. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about attracting beneficial insects. Adult insects need nectar or pollen to get the energy needed to lay eggs and they need plants to get it from. They like lots of herbs like fennel and dill and parsley, as well as flowers from the daisy family, like sunflowers, coreopsis, echinacea, cornflowers, or bachelor buttons. They lay eggs in the larvae that hatch, eat a lot of the bad bugs that are eating your plants. Aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, and scale are the most common pests that they'll go for. Ladybugs, they like plants like ajuga, marigolds, and dandelions. They also love to eat aphids, spider mites, and mealybugs but the larvae that they produce look like little black alligators with orange markings. And those guys will eat probably twice as many as the adult ladybugs eat, or as the adult ladybugs eat. So if you see these little black alligator looking dudes with little racing stripes and orange up close to their front legs, those are actually your ladybug larva. Okay, so leave them alone. They're, <laughs> they're gonna do wonders in your garden. Lace wings. Those are those little tiny pale green bugs with those delicate see-through wings. They like yarrow, dill, coriander, cosmos, prairie sunflowers, alyssum, and dandelions. If you were to catch and hold one, you'd find off, they, they kind of let off a little bit of a stink. Their larvae look like little green or brown alligators, and they eat aphids, scale insects, thrips, and other small caterpillars. These bugs have such big appetites. There's only one egg laid on a stalk so that when they hatch, they don't eat their siblings. Ha, huh, nasty, huh? Hoverflies. Now these guys are black and white or black and yellow and look like wasps, but they don't have stingers. They also have the unique ability to hover over a plant. Bee balm and daisy type flowers are what they like. Eggs are laid in aphid colonies and the little green gray larvae eat the aphids that most insects are too big to even reach. The larva can commonly be found underneath plant leaves where aphids are. So if you see a little maggoty guy, don't worry, it's a good thing. Parasitic wasps are also tiny and non-stinging wasps. The adults prefer members of the carrot and daisy families and they lay their eggs in or on the pests. The larvas absorb the nutrients through their skin and leave the dead bug behind. Look for them sitting on plant leaves, wiggling their antenna as they smell for food. Spiders, crab spiders like yellow, white, like yellow white nectar producing flowers like yarrow and goldenrod. Wolf spiders like places with debris to hide in. Jumping spiders like the sunny spots on trees and sidewalks or the side of my house. Orb weavers like their webs and they all like gardens that attract lots of insects to feed on. And ground beetles. Those guys like undisturbed soil and they eat slugs, caterpillars and other insects. So that's another reason why you should be planting at least a few flowers in your vegetable garden because you want to attract all these ladybugs, lacewings, hoverflies, and parasitic wasps, and spiders and ground beetles because then you don't have to use pesticides. Hi, it's Candace again with Grow Local and today we're going to talk about garlic. This is mine. I probably planted it in September or October of last year so it should be ready in July it's not quite ready yet we are in the middle of January but we've got this wonderful sunshine that decided to come out and visit today but I'm going to show you what you're looking for and how to do this anyway so here's my garlic it's a hard neck and hard necks get what are called scapes and if I can find one here's one it's just starting to grow here now these are actually just the flower buds on a long stem and what you want to do is wait until they grow and they'll curl once or twice and that's when you can cut them off and then you just use them in soups in stews in your salads you can pickle them they're absolutely wonderful here's one that has curled and that's what you're looking for and they really do they are a lovely lovely garlic taste you guys when you go to harvest your garlic You've cut the scape off so that hopefully that plant has put more energy into creating a really big bulb. You're gonna look 
and you're going to look for the bottom three or four leaves to have turned brown and crisped up. Some places will, some people will tell you that you want to get the bottom two thirds, but I kind of counted the leaves and three or four leaves is about two thirds of the plant on these ones. And what you want to do is you want to be gentle because you've got each of those leaves that died off represents a paper wrapper around your garlic bulb and you don't want to break them. So just use your fingers rather than a trowel because these guys don't always grow as straight as you think they're going to. And it's tough in here. And there we go. So this for me is probably just a small one. Give it another couple weeks and it would probably get a lot larger. And like I said, you're going to have the papery wrappings around. That hasn't even really cloved up for me a whole lot. So I'm thinking I'm probably a good two, three weeks away from, from getting these. Now, when you've taken it out, you're gonna to wanna to cure it. And by doing that, again, it depends on who you talk to. Some people will tell you to leave it in the sun. Some people tell you to leave it in the shade. Me, I take it like this and I have some plastic trays from the garden center and I just turfed everything behind me. So I've got some plastic trays. I just put this on and it's against a, a wall and it gets morning sun and then the rest of the day it's in the shade. But primarily you want really good air circulation. When this is all dried off and browned up, then you're gonna cut this part off and you can wipe off with a toothbrush maybe some of the soil and you can trim the leaves off. Now this is the hard neck one and I did these last year. And because of the flower scape, that's where you get the hard neck from. And they will tell you to probably to chop it off. You want a longer stem on it so that the moisture doesn't leave the bulbs. The ones that I cut off really short, they've started to go soft on me. The ones that I left this long or longer, they're still really nice and firm and I can still use them. Um, but you cut it off, take off some of the loose papers, trim your roots up really well. If you can use a toothbrush to try to clean it off a little bit better. But the one thing you don't want to do is wash them, okay? Don't get them wet, then they're just going to rot on you, okay? And then once you have two things we're going to talk about, once you've got all your garlic out of the bed, what do you do? Well, don't waste your space. You can grow something like a broccoli or asparagus, like what I've got here, or in July, that's when it's time to plant your celery up. So you can put celery in here too. And then if you're smart, you will keep a couple of these bulbs because you're gonna to wanna to plant the cloves again in September or October. And the bigger the clove, the bigger the bulb you're gonna get. One other thing that you can do is leave one of the scapes on. Let it go to flower and it's gonna get all these lovely little bulbs on the, on the end of it. You're gonna have all these little teeny tiny mini garlics and you probably will have 50 of them on there. The trick for those is you get a pot that's about, they say 12 inches deep is better. Sometimes you can only find them six inches deep, but you're gonna take those little bulbs and you're gonna plant them one inch deep and about two inches apart. From, lovely dog, he's okay. So you're gonna take those little bulbs and you'll put them in the soil, one inch deep, two inches apart. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna sink them in the garden with your regular garlic cloves if you've potted them up, or planted them up rather. Um, and the reason you do that is because you don't want them to freeze over the winter. And in the spring, when your regular garlic starts to grow, you're gonna find little things that look like little grass blades coming up out of that pot just let them grow. When you harvest the, when you harvest your regular bulbs, you'll be able to take those little bulbs out. They're only gonna be about a half inch in size, but just store them the same way you're doing your garlic. And then the next year when you plant those, they will grow into regular sized garlic bulbs. So you're getting a bigger bang for your buck if you do it that way. It takes a little bit longer, but they do say if you grow from bulbs that your garlic bulbs will be bigger and they'll be healthier and you'll have fewer problems with pests. And if you don't know how to plant, it's pretty easy. All you're doing is breaking the cloves off that base plate. You don't peel the wrappers off. You're gonna make a hole about four inches deep. 
so that when you put that garlic clove in there, it's got a, it's covered by one to two inches of soil and you're done. But you're not gonna do that until September or October. This is going in my dinner pot tonight. And that's it for garlic.